Hello, everyone, and welcome to Therapy for Nerds. I am one of your co-hosts, Cassidy Russell, along with <laughs> Abby Ronquillo and Katie Bussey. And today, so I was scrolling through Twitter, as I often do, trying not to doom scroll, but you know, it's, it's, the, it's the year of doom scrolling. But I came across this, I think it's a blog post. Originally, I thought it was an article, I think, but looking at it, Think it's more of a blog post. I will link it in the description, but it's gaming in kids' own words. So the article or whatever takes interviews from kids about their perspective on video games, which I thought was really interesting because there's a lot of talk about video games and if it's good, if it's bad. Mostly, I, all I hear is how it's bad, but. I don't feel like we get the perspective from the child too often of how it can actually be, well, what they actually think about it. Because I, I did th see not all of the children were like, hey, let's pl only play games all day long, which is what you would think to hear based off of a lot of other people's assumptions. But I just thought it was a really interesting thing. And I think we should be doing more of that. I would love to see like an actual study done of that or like more case studies, but I wanted to ask you guys, what was your opinion? Yeah, well, I think, I think it's so interesting. Like when I was first reading this, because it is true. Like a lot of the people that were talked about and there were pretty young kids, like um very early in life and it's not often that those are the kind of people you hear reviews about games from right or like what they like about games or how they play them um and i think it's it's almost kind of like a missed opportunity to not be able to hear it because I, I enjoyed reading about like the pieces they honed in on like the maybe like a crafting part of a game that we all just like take for granted or the the connection with being able to see their family and like play with relatives who live far away or whatever it may be and i I don't know, it's such a, it makes sense that it exists, but it's just not something we talk about enough. Yeah, Abby? Yeah, you know, at the beginning of the article, prior to them actually interviewing the children, um, there was a little bit of a preface where it was discussing how not only the voices of children, but a lot of like these marginalized groups, they're not really taken seriously, or sometimes we, t we tend to discredit them. And, you know, as a therapist that works with children or, you know, has a history of working with this population, you know, I never really thought about it that way that a lot of times we kind of just especially when working with the parents for example we talk about the children like oh well you know they're at an age where they might not understand this concept or we don't give them a lot of credit in regards to what they'll be able to articulate for themselves so mm -hmm. we try to do it for them or put the steps in place for them when really i think this article was a really for me anyways a big eye opener to realize you know what why not like yes they might not be developmentally at a space where they have the capacity of someone who's much older, but the autonomy is there. They probably know a lot more than we think they do. Yeah, like I liked, so there's many different perspectives, but you go from like the six-year-old who kind of complained about not being able to play whenever they wanted, but then you got down to like this 10-year-old who was like, yeah, these are the restrictions my parents put on me, and I think it's good so it doesn't rot my brain. Like that was the perfect <laughs> quote from it. And I thought that was really funny. Probably is something their parents have said, but I just thought it was really interesting how we have this idea that kids can't control their gaming and internet and gaming addiction is on the rise and it's so bad. But then you have like these kids that are like, yeah, I would love to play more, but I can totally see and it's understandable why my parents would have these restrictions on me. And I just thought that was really interesting. And we don't talk about these kids that do have that understanding. We don't talk about them enough. Yeah, and I, I, I love the idea of like the way they approach it. Like, oh, it's gonna rot my brain. Like we, like you said, like we know that was probably the parents who said that, and they're they're using the same phrase. But what they are they are learning in moments like that is like how to have. Uh, an appropriate use of enjoyable things like have the you know the kind of balance so to speak of playing games and taking time away and doing other activities and I 
I think it's so great at a, such a young age to be able to start developing that skill because how, how much that that's going to serve them as they get older and they learn to regulate their own activities and uh, create structure around that. And it's interesting when you ask, when we ask these questions about not even to children, but to anyone in general, but specifically in this article to children about themselves, about what they enjoy, what they like about these games, um, what their experience is like, you get a lot more information. So mm -hmm. even just taking that example and kind of the language that they were using and kind of pairing that with their language of their parent, that kind of says a lot about the relationship that they have with their parent. Mm -hmm. Well, Abby, what you keep saying, like it, it reminds me of what the therapy style that's called motivational interviewing, which is most often utilized in um, areas like addiction. And one of the one of the key components, especially at the beginning, is finding out what that behavior actually does for the person. So if they're addicted to a substance, like what are the positives that they're getting? Because we can sit here and talk about the negatives all the live long day, like as people that have been trained and have extensive education in the use of substances, like it, that's not what we specialize in, but we did take classes in that. And so we could talk all the live long day about the negative impacts, but motivational interviewing brings up the point that, yeah, there's all these negative impacts, but there has to be something that the person's getting out of it. Otherwise, why would they continue doing it? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that it's like taking that first step in motivational interviewing, which is asking the kids, hey, what do you get out of this? And it makes a lot of sense. And they make some really good points. One thing I always love to do when I meet people who like playing games, and I, I love to ask them, like, what are some of your favorite games? And like, I think that's what they did in this interview is they were like, okay, what are the ones you really enjoy? And being able to hear like, what is it about those games specifically that you enjoy? Because there's such a wide variety of genres out there that you can choose from, 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 that you can choose from such as like, you know, more slow story based games or more fast paced, like first person shooter to like tycoon games. Like there's such a wide variety. And I think there's also a lot that can be, be taken from those preferences about like maybe how they even like to interact with other people. Because if there's someone who prefers more slow, um, take your time kind of games, it's very possible that can reflect how they like to interact in the world. Yeah, like a kid that prefers Animal Crossing versus a kid that prefers Fortnite. Yeah, yeah, because those are, those are going to be very different games and, you know, it's going to require a, a totally different approach. And I noticed too, a lot of the kids, uh, because one of the questions for the, the article was like what their favorite game was or what they liked to play. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them were extensive. Um, some of the titles, most of them I recognized were not all the same type of games. Mm -hmm. And some of them gave reasonings to why they like certain games. And a lot of it had to do with like socialization. One mm -hmm. of them mentioned um, playing with uh, like a family member that was living in a different state. Mm -hmm. um, and I can imagine that was probably one of the games that they had mentioned was um, you know, like a, a multiplayer game. And then they also mentioned like playing Zelda. So, you know, maybe there are games that they like to play specifically because they want to engage in a different type of activity. Yeah, and that, that's so true because like games are set up differently depending on whether or not they're intended to be played with other people or played on their own. Um, and, and I can imagine for a lot of people, their interests vary depending on whether or not they're looking to get that socialization piece out of it. If they want to connect with family who lives far away or their friends in the area versus like I just want to like jump into a different world like I know one of the kids brought up like liking the sims and like just wanting to escape to live a different life and like try something different try out a new reality in a way um, and I, I think there's a lot that's gonna there's there's a lot that's gonna come from that like what people are looking for and what kind of games they're drawn to yeah one thing that got mentioned several times is just the interactive piece especially during a pandemic of just like, yeah, you don't want me to play games, but how else am I supposed to socialize when there's like, I, I think one of them even said like, I would be fine not playing a game if I could socialize in a different way. Like what else do you expect me to do right now? Which I thought was a really good point. Yeah, and especially because a lot of times it's hard to know what else to talk about too. And games are kind of a, an intermediate activity that gives us something to to connect on, to talk about, to bond over versus like 
well, it's number 50 weeks in, you know, like, or whatever it may be, like, what, what else is there to talk about a lot of times for people? Yeah. And that's so true. Katie, even like, um, as I've noticed with my clients coming into session every week, you know, they feel like there isn't that much progressively happening on the week to week basis, especially in the pandemic, because they aren't going out seeing their friends. They're not working. They're not going to school. So things are not necessarily happening at the same rate that they would. I mean, things are happening, but they're not happening for as progressively as they would have mm-hmm. if we were not experiencing a lockdown. So I feel like a lot of times you're right. There has to be something that, tangible in the sense of uh, working towards or some type of goal for you to focus your attention on and for you not to feel the sense of um, anxiety from I don't have anything to bring to the table or I don't have anything to talk about or I don't, mm-hmm. I'm not an interesting person because I know that's something that a lot of people may feel, especially when they don't know what to say. Yeah, because so much of communication is having stories to share and being able to talk about what, what we've been doing, what how our week was, how these different events were. And when those are not transpiring in the same way that they used to, it can, like you said, it can, it can cause anxiety to be like, well, I don't want to talk to someone if I don't have anything to talk about. So for... <laughs> For this article, I know it was an interview with a bunch of of different aged individuals in their kind of experiences with games. Um, I I wonder in looking at this, and I know we had touched on the idea of wanting there to be more of this done, right? Like wanting there to be more snapshots into the lives of younger people and their experiences with games. Um, And I, I wonder like, what are some other thoughts that we have about like what there might be there that we're missing out on that we aren't talking about or we aren't seeing because we don't hear about these interviews as often. Well, I think we, like, we have spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about the potential benefits of playing games. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we have a good idea of what some of those are, especially because, you know, we all three of us grew up playing video games. But I think things have changed a lot since we were kids. Like even I work with primarily teenagers and their lives are a lot different. I'm not that old. (laughs) Like it hasn't been as long since I've been a teenager as like a lot of the other therapists I know. We can speculate on how it impacts teenagers today based off of our experiences. But I think it's good to actually hear straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, how it's impacting them. 